uh, thank you so much for coming uh, today. Uh, I would first like to thank the Toronto International Film Festival to, for inviting me uh, this week to talk on two occasions, uh, for today and tomorrow, for the retrospective on Usman Semben. Uh, I'd like to personally thank uh, Cameron Bailey, who initiated the invitation, and Teresa Scandifio for really doing a great job of coordinating my coming here. Uh, especially to present my work as part of Higher Learning Fridays. Um, what I'm going to present today is uh, part of uh, my research for an upcoming book um, on the history of documentary film in Africa. Uh, and it's in the process of doing research on where documentary began in relation to Africa that I almost stumbled upon the Lumiere, so to speak. Uh, so I hope to work on that and sort of submit it for publication soon. Okay, so of course we all know that the Lumiere are part of the totemic fathers of our discipline. Um, Louis, the younger brothers, brother, August, the older brother, they're known as the inventors of the cinematograph and uh, consecrated in history uh, accordingly. We know that they were also inventing many other things, right? They contributed lots of invention in areas such as photography, chemistry. Um, they sold photographic plates. They, inv they invented color photography, the photorama, and even um, uh, contributed to inventions in medicine itself. Now, this, of course, their work has to be seen, of course, uh, uh, in relation to a global competition, as you remember, if you remember the time, sort of late 1800s, where people were trying to uh, come up with be the best ways of capturing um, and reproducing, decomposing and reproducing uh, movement. And so there a long, a long continuum uh, with people like Edison, for example, who had at least started before them <laughs> with the kinetograph and the kinetoscope, but um, his invention did not uh, last in the sense that the cinematograph happened to be lighter, so more portable, and of course could project and film at once. Uh, there's an anecdote about the invention of that I really like, uh, and I, um, it's about the way in which the F F Lumiere father got his children interested in doing something about cinema. I I'll read that, I'll read it to you. So Charles Moisson, who was the chief mechanic at the Lumiere factory and builder of the original cinematograph, recounted the following anecdote about the catalytic moment. He says, during the summer of 1894, the Lumiere father came to my office where I was with Louis, and he pulled out of his pocket a strip of the kinetoscope and literally said to Louis, this is what you should be doing because Edison is selling these at unbelievable prices, and the concessionaires are trying to manufacture these strips here in France because they want them at better price. And so Charles Moisson continues, this strip, which I still have in front of my eyes and which was about 30 centimeters long was exactly like the current film strip with four perforations per image. It showed a scene at the barber. And I think I'd, I had not in fact seen that, that, that footage except for the first time I saw it was actually this year. I was trying to show to my uh, graduate documentary students sort of the beginnings of documentary and I, so I said okay I'll show them a sample of Lumiere, Edison, even even Méliès because he did in fact uh, actualities or reenactments and so as I was showing the, the the Edison I saw the scene at the Barber so I had the feeling that so this the tradition uh, of, of uh, the stages of the the, the creation of of um, the cinematograph, at least in my head, sort of was was a bit complete, at least more complete now. Okay, now what did they do after they invented the cinematograph? So with their new camera, they set up filming first, of course, we know, the immediate environment, so the factory, the family, the workers, and later they opened up, of course, the dissemination and production process to the world at large. So we can say that there was a gradual move from private to public, from family to the world, that encapsulate both their story 
to, of course, they had a family business in an industrial age and that of their times as well. Okay, we all know um, the whole first screening question, which was December 28, 1895. It's not the first screening, but the first, I think Andre Godre is the best at coming up with, with the way of characterizing it. The first P, 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 so P, P times four, <laughs> which means the first paying public projection, if you will, yeah, premier projection public payant, yeah, P, 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 okay, all right. Um, so, of course, some of the first films we know include Arrival of the Train, Work at Living Factory, and many that any obligatory uh, film student, a film course, intro film course, uh, typically has. Uh, now, uh, these, of course, are not the only film, it's, it's right? Uh, it is also important to know that the Lumiere uh, shot no less than 1,428 or 30 films in that range. And that those that we see recycled really represent less than 0. 0.000 some percent of what they've actually done. And so as part of this large body of work, uh, they have also an impressive corpus of film that they shot in and about Africa. They consist in about, I think, a hundred. Um, this, of course, should not be a surprise because, of course, the coast of Africa is right under the Mediterranean there, so it's sort of very close to Europe. And so um, they reach the coast of Africa very, very quickly, so to speak, after the invention of the cinematograph. Now, where... So I refer to this body of work made in Africa as the Lumiere Africa Corpus, okay? Now, where was it shot? The corpus was shot in Algeria, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in France, in Britain, and Switzerland. Now, this actually, um, I came across a reference by somebody who was not a Lumiere operator, but a personal friend of the Lumiere. I think his name was Vatem Perignon, who had, I think, to whom the Lumiere actually gave a cinematograph to go to Africa and make films. So these films are not part of the Lumiere corpus, but they were shot with the cinematograph in a contemporary fashion with those that we're going to be talking about. Of course, I'll do my best to find out where the film is, if, of course, it still exists. Now, temporality. Uh, we can say that uh, the footage was therefore shot between March 1896, so less than three months after the first pay, 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 pay. Uh, and I would say some of the last ones uh, were shot in 1903. That's the range that we're talking about, 1896, 1903. Okay. Um, in 1903, uh, when, of course, uh, um, one of their um, chief operators, whose name was Alexander Promio, made his last trip on their behalf on the continent as part of a de delegation of reporters accompanying the then French president, Emile Loubet. Okay. And so the exact years are 1896, although it spans five years, not um, um, it, it spans um, seven years. The exact years where the, the, the where Africa was filmed are 1896, 1897, and 1903. Okay. Now, what are some of the major features of the Lumiere Africa Corpus? Uh, we can consider that there were at least uh, among the first who have com consistently put Africa on the cinematic screen and displayed it for the purpose of audiences in Europe and elsewhere. So in Algeria, for example, which were the most film of all the countries in Africa, it was after all the French, not even a colony with the French department. Um, um, so in Algeria, um, 
so Algeria with the most film, but uh, Egypt also really, really uh, receives a significant number of, of interest from the operator, and Tunisia, of course. Now, they did not go physically south of the Sahara, as we typically say, except we have this Vatem Perignon who did, who did his films in Ethiopia. Yeah. Um, but of course, we could say perhaps they didn't have to go because the south of the Sahara came to them through uh, human exhibitions. Okay. Uh, now, we can divide this corpus into a number of genres, I think two broad categories, if you will. I think one, we can say, uh, includes the travelogue. And the second, uh, the term is sort of weird term that I've come up with. It's called this, uh, that I refer to as the minimal genre. It, it sort of putting together the idea of um, human exhibition, right? Where uh, men and animals are put along the same continuum, if you will. Okay, so the travelogue was mostly shot physically on the continent when Alexandre Promio, probably the most one one of the most important Lumiere operators, went there in late 1896 and returned in 1903 for a longer stay. The minimal genre, however, was shot primarily in Europe when Africans were brought over from Africa in order to be exhibited at the Zoological Acclimatization Garden of Paris and in Lyon, the birthplace of the cinematography. So a few other films fit within this category, and those were filmed in Geneva, the national exhibition in Switzerland. In Switzerland. So let's look at these two large corpses. First, the travelogue. Of course, we know the importance of tra the travelogue for documentary. John Grayson himself says, I always think of documentary as having fundamental chapters. The first chapter is, of course, the travelogue. And so... Travelogues were shot in Africa itself, and so we can talk about subgenres of the travelogue, which include the street scenes, and what I refer to as the official cinema genre of the Lumiere, the picturesque as well. So let's look at some of them uh, very quickly. If you think about the street scenes, for example, they were really the object, an object of fascination for the Lumiere operator, especially when they're out of their country. So in some regard, the scenes were even more fascinating when they were located in places considered culturally remote from Europe. So with this frame of mind, one could see the fascination exerted on them by streets uh, scenes in Algeria, Egypt, and Tunisia, respectively. So example, I don't have any example to show you of this part of the presentation for one very good reason. The institution that is in charge of administering the cinematic legacy of the Lumière, who are referred to as the Association Frères Lumière, who are based in Paris, are really sort of exercising unbelievable, I wouldn't say censorship, but certainly refusal to release. It's not specific to the Africa footage, by the way, so I have to be clear about that. But they just want, in fact, uh, collaborate with researchers who are interested in having these films, as you know, to illustrate their talks. I tried all kinds of strategies. Uh, even Jean Claude Seguin, who is one of the two people who wrote the catalog, who so he was part of the people who did the fourteen hundred and twenty-five films, sort of the notes, does not have access to. To this, uh, cannot in fact have access to, to, to these films. So there's only, again, one person I've seen in my life so far with that footage. I think James, I can see James in the room. James was probably, probably there the same day in Paris in 2006 or seven, 2007 probably, where Jean Louis Comoli, whom we all know, <laughs> came to the saint George Pompidou to present something on the Lumiere. And of course, most of the stuff that he presented was really the usual stuff, typically, that we see, except some other uh, effect-related footage of the Lumiere. But he's the only one for whom the Association Frère Lumiere did a particular DVD to illustrate his presentation. 
So we are no Jean-Louis Comolli, clearly. <laughs> so, uh, but I'll, I, and I, I, as I was preparing for this talk, I, you know, I think I was in correspondence with Clarissa. I said, you know, maybe perhaps, uh, with Tiff, they might be impressed and so on. <laughs> they were not impressed. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, so we'll try to find other ways to at least bring these films from the shadows, so to speak. And hopefully uh, in a couple of years, something will happen. Okay, so street scenes were shot in Algeria. After like Rue Babazoum, Rue Mascara, Rue Sidi Boumedine, Rue de France, etc. In Egypt, you also had Rue Sayed Zainab, Rue El Khadira, Rue Nassin in Tunisia, Rue Port Babab El Khadra, Rue Sidi Ben Harous, and Rue El Alpha Win. Of course, this has a resonance for us because Alpha Win is one of the important films in African cinema, uh, directed by Tunisian filmmaker Ferid Bougidi, who is also one of our first critics. So there's a resonance there. Okay, the second. Um, Subgenre, so to speak, of the travelogue in Africa, I would refer to as the official cinema genre. And here, um, we know, for example, that a large portion of the Lumiere filmography was devoted to officialdom. Yeah, that is the idea of filming the institutional power of government, the people who exercise power over others, and of course, the entire regime of mise en scène of political. And so from its beginning then, we can say that the cinema, or at least the Lumiere cinema, can be said to have flirted with the apparatus of political power. This is important to really keep in mind as we go through the rest of the presentation. So kings, queens, presidents, princes, monarchs were filmed in both their private and public lives. And although the Lumiere could not necessarily refuse, if asked by a monarch, <laughs> they did inaugurate a set of relations with political power that will have staying power throughout the history of our medium. Right, And so the first kind of relation, of course, we know is that of celebration. They celebrated, really, political power instead of critiquing it, for example. Mm -hmm. So the film Coronation, the coronations of several monarchs, including Russia Tsar Nikolai, the King, King Charles of Romania, Guillaume II in World War II, uh, King Norodom of, of, of the first of Cambodia, among others. They also traveled with French heads of state on their trips in and outside their country. Uh, so being among the wave of individuals who probably invented embedded journalism, at least embedded filmed journalism. And finally, the film Military Parade that celebrated the military might of uh, the colonial powers, in fact. Uh, and so, of course, uh, when these were shot in the colony, it became a tacit or explicit celebration of colonialism. They also filmed monuments and squares. Yeah, which bore the trace or traces or were dedicated to the triumph of colonialism. Um, uh, now, the period, therefore, of this official cinema is again 1896, 97, and 1903. Again, I have no example, unfortunately, for you. Um, Um, so if you take into account um, the mise en scène, for example, of state protocol, uh, they did, I think, about 16 films where they were shooting the French president disembarking from Algiers, his breakfast, medal award ceremonies, etc., etc. Okay, so there's another uh, category that we'll look at now, which is what I'll call the picturesque which involves, of course, the production of Orientalist uh, fantasy, so to speak. And this is uh, characterized by uh, uh, asking or requiring of the subject being filmed uh, to produce their radical difference, if you will. Now, part of the Lumiere filmography in Africa has also included a, a body of films emphasizing the picturesque, most specifically films that conveyed an idea of radical difference from Europe. And so one of the significant events that took place, for example, during that presidential visit that I was talking about right now, uh, illustrate this. So it consisted in adding local flavor to the serious diplomatic visit of the president. 
It also fulfilled the function of demonstrating the submission, submission of Africans and their culture as they were asked to produce their own difference. And thus, a parade of, of camels, for example, was organized for the president and filmed in southern Algeria in the Crida camp by Alexandre Premier on April 21, 1903. The show included a, the simulacrum or, of, or a reenactment, if you will, of a caravan attack. It involved the kidnapping of a bride. And of course, the title is Défilé des Chameaux avec les Bassos, the Camels Parade with Bassos. Um, Egypt is also important to stop uh, and focus on a little bit because the footage in Egypt, um, in addition to almost doing some of the same thing that it did in, um, in Algeria and Tunisia, also uh, raises questions, I would say, about film form, yeah? uh, especially two issues, the question of deep staging and the question of continuity editing. One, deep staging. So one of the films uh, that's important to think about is Place de l'Opera, um, which shows, so uh, it's the sort of film number 372. So it shows the traffic on Opera Square. So Egyptian men we see are riding donkeys, where Europeans wearing suits, ties, and top hats are walking or riding horses. So the Egyptians tend the horses, pull the horses. Now we notice a clear division of labor. So two Europeans, aware of the camera's presence, work toward it. It becomes increasingly clear that the scene was set up for them, right? Uh, following the mode of a photo album, if you will, or a film album in this case. So we see that the cinematograph puts itself at the disposal of the colonial inhabitants of colonized land to make a mise-en-scene of their purported superiority. Now, when you look at the footage very closely, it becomes clear also that it is the footage is more about the European men ordering the Egyptians around, demanding that they show their submissive position by playing the role of the hands, so to speak, of European men. And the body language, of course, is explicit. The European smile, walk nonchalantly with the hands in their pocket. Of course, Egyptians are working really hard tending horses. The film starts if, with a mise en place of three men and their horse carriers. So the men come toward the center of the frame and move back to its background. As they move back, passing, passing coaches right across the frame in close proximity to the camera. So we just, we just have two planes of action. The foreground, which is closer, but where the action is of little narrative import, so to speak. And the background, where the action is the backbone of the shot. At the end of the film, the three men, perhaps responding, I would say even clearly responding to a command from the operator, walk toward the camera, smiling. As they get close to it, they turn their back to look at the Egyptian horse tender. So we have a case of staging the main action in depth and the action moving slowly from the background to the foreground to the movement across space of the three protagonists who stand out graphically, of course, with their black costumes and white skin, where the dresses of the Egyptian come out in black and white, in the black and white film as grayish and whitish. This, of course, further emphasizes the merging into the background, literally and figuratively, making the Europeans action, uh, agents of action. And so we can say that the poetics of space is put uh, at the service of the narrative of domination and spectacle. For the project is to di display one's power over the native, so to speak. And we can say that the horse is the intermediary or the currency of this hierarchical visual economy. Now, the film is also an, about the orchestration of the gaze in terms of where to look, what to look at, when, and where to put emphasis in terms of deciphering the thrust of a narrative. This, of course, is a profoundly aesthetic question for film, right? Um, and raises, of course, the question, how do we represent the colonial situation in cinema? How do we represent the relationship between colonizers and colonizers within the vocabulary of cinema? Or to what extent does the colonial question incite questions of aesthetics and representation, especially in these early days of cinema? Yeah. So to what extent has film aesthetic therefore been influenced by colonialism? 
Baraj Janil is another example, right? Uh, Baraj Janil uh, was um, is one of the first, I would say, signifiers of progress in this category. Again, here the camera is positioned by railroad tracks, which cross dams. So imagine railroad tracks, um, yeah, which cross the dam. So in this scene, we see a group of Egyptian men animals and their owners mounted on horses or donkeys. Behind the Egyptian, we see two Egyptians in a rail cart. The, the European, sorry, the Egyptian, we see two Europeans in a rail cart. So to the non-vigilant eye, their appearance in the frame may appear random. But as we move closer to the foreground, we get a close view at them looking at the Lumiere operators and making a sign of the head. Again, as in the previous show, Egyptians are pushing the rail cast card faster and faster. Behind the rail card, we can see an Egyptian man running. They exit the frame and we see more Egyptians coming forward with the animal. Then we see the two European men reappear in the hand-pushed rail card. And the same Egyptian men pushing them at higher speed until the film stops. So it's clear here that the scene was actually set up to film the two Europeans riding their rail cart off, off, out, and back into the frame. Once again, an action that's literally staged in the background of the frame grows to become the most important aspect of the action for the spectator. So we can talk about a dual regime, regime of narration, if you will, whereby part of the film is clearly and openly staged, whereas the other part is more a sli on, in the slice of life mode, right? Um, very good. So this, of course, is sort of contributes to the mise en scène, as I said, of colonial domination, even in this small, uh, playful scene. The Egyptians, of course, are clearly not playing, right? Are they working, going to work, or pushing their cart with Europeans, uh, jubilantly enjoying just sitting and being pushed down and up the rails of progress and having it filmed for posterity? So the second aspect um, is, of course, the problem of continuity editing. Uh, Alexander Promio uh, made a series of films on the famous uh, Castle El Nil Bridge. And these films are entitled Pont Castle El Nil, so Castle El Nil Bridge, Sortie du Pont Castle El Nil Chameau. So that is exiting Castle and Nil Bridge. So camels exiting Castle and Nil Bridge. Uh, then, sortie du pont Castle and Nil Anne. So donkeys exiting Castle and Nil Bridge. And finally, Castle. So you have four, four separate films, right? There's four separate numbers. So number three, 365, 366, 367, 368. Um, Castle El Nil was one of the most important bridges in the world at the time. You have to remember the Nile, the Nile, the importance of the Nile. So crossing the longest river in the world. So in the first installment of the series, we see Pont, in Pont Castle El Nil, we see various people crossing the bridge in both directions. And a long line of traders with their camels and their carts are headed to the market with their merchandise. That's the first. In the second uh, film, which is entitled Sortie du Pont Castrelli, we have the follow-up to the previous scene where the caravan of camel with a hay, um, with a caravan of camel with a hay on their back. What's striking here is the narrative continuity between these two films. If in the previous film we saw the camels crossing the bridge, this time we see them exiting the bridge, right? Entry, exit. Um, there's a sense of a before and an after, a special organization, if you will, of temporality. Now, this is buttressed by the next film in the series called Sortie du Pont Castle El Nil Anne, where we now see donkeys exiting the screen. So first entering, then exiting. This is one of the first such formal exercises that one sees, at least in the Lumiere Africa Corpus, and possibly one of the first instances of attempting uh, continuity editing without using an editing machine or without the direct intervention of exhibitors, for example, who used to put films, you know, uh, uh, one after the other in the process of screening. 
It takes place in camera, but only makes sense when shown in sequence, right? And is testimony to the idea, perhaps, that one of the first experiments of continuity editing may have taken place in Africa, in Egypt, as early as 1897. Okay. So now we'll look at the second batch of um, of images, though, that were shot um, as part of the category that I refer to as the minimal genre, and for which we now have clips. Uh, so we'll call minimal the genre in which the frontiers between the human and the animal are blurred, whether physically, psychologically, or even intellectually, in which humans are put in on on the same continuum as animals, with a strong emphasis on the bestial than on the human dimension. This is a genre of film, of course, that was made within the framework of colonial and universal exhibitions of the late 19th and 20th century. Uh, we know that these exhibitions were twofold. On the one hand, they showed what we consider the latest celebrate the latest technological, industrial, and scientific innovations of the time. Um, for example, the Eiffel Tower was inaugurated at one such exhibition in, in 1899. And so the cinematograph itself was exhibited at such <laughs> exhibition. Uh, but the other dimension of them is that they work in a dialect, that, that work in a dialectic of relationship with the previous one. That one had to equate, there's a sort of equation, therefore, of progress with Europe, so to speak, right? Uh, and a sort of way in which this gave a both geographic and racial boundary uh, to the idea of progress. And so every geographic area or race, so to speak, outside those boundaries was, of course, to a large extent considered either immune or slow to progress in, in states of stagnation and requiring, therefore, a European in intervention. And so... People from as diverse spaces as Africans, Asians, uh, even I think people from Canada came as well. I think the Inuits came as well. Um, everybody was called upon to put and display their different to participate in the mise-en-scene of alterity. There was, of course, initially a physical separation, there was a fence between the people displayed and those who came to observe them. These were literally zoos, right? So if you come think about the idea that, for example, the legacy of African cinema is that the first time Africans found them, one of the first time Africans found themselves in front of the camera was inside a zoo. That, of course, has uh, implications that we can uh, talk about afterwards. And, of course, these zoos were reportedly reported equivalent to the cinema cinemas of, the, of today in terms of mass spectacle, because they're extremely and highly popular. Now, the Lumière, being men of their time, <laughs> made films uh, of these zoos. Uh, the first of them was shot on May 7th, 1896, at the Geneva National Exhibition in Switzerland, and the second at the Zoological Acclim Acclimatization Garden of Paris between June and 12 July 1896, and the last at the birthplace of the cinematograph itself in Lyon between April 17th and July 20th, 1897. So we'll focus on the Lyon uh, footage. So the films that were shot in Lyon are part of what we can call, they refer to them as the Ashanti Village series. Um, uh, and these villages, of course, were basically... Um, uh, are they the practice of this exhibition in, in, in involved bringing people from Africa recreating their living conditions in Europe and displaying fauna, people, food habits on the same plane for Europeans to see. And that was, of course, very common at the time. Of course, he participated in a much larger and high, highly lucrative business of exhibiting, interpreting otherness for one's own design. And we can talk about an industry of alterity, as it were, <laughs> that came to exist in Europe over the course of at least 70 years, right? So the Ashanti village was very much part of that. And participates in this economy of alterity from a monetary and, of course, a uh, representational standpoint. 
So 14 films were shot between April 17th and July 20th, 1896, in a series of films that would document various aspects of Ashanti life in the pure, in the pure ethnographic tradition. Starting, of course, with the dancing, the parades, the schooling of the children, the way they watch their children, and ending with their eating habits. So, the delegation of Ashantis that came was 200. So, they brought 200 people from Ghana, or from the former Gold Coast. Yeah, They included the Ashanti chief, whose name was Chief Boche. We actually have name, which is really uh, great. We only have the names of three people out of 200, at least uh, in the record that I've seen. I hope to, f- one of my dreams is to find out the name of each of these people and hopefully get these films and sort of, sh- sort of show it to them, so to speak. Go to Ghana and sort of show it somehow. That, that would really make me happy. Okay, so, so Chief Boche, his wife, Akosia, they were accompanied by sculptors, blacksmiths, jewelers, weavers, basket makers, and of course, one of the most important figures in that group, Mr. Oko, who was an elementary teacher who had his students um, with him. So one of the singularities, of course, of this Ashanti village footage, or this minimal genre shot in Lyon, is that the, no, we don't to this day know who shot the footage. So the 14 films have no author. 14 films in search of an author, shall we say, at this point. That's also a work in progress, I suppose, for us to, 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 to do. Okay. Uh, film number one, I think, that I will show is The Parade. I won't really say more. We'll just look at it and then contextualize it. So this is the chief. This is this is the Ashanti walking. And we have this is Mr. These parades had their place in the general mise en scène of Alter, you have to remember. They really underscored, first and foremost, the defeat of Africans in front of European armies, right? And so when you were defeated uh, at home, you were brought as a trophy of the defeated and displayed for people to see, right? Now, this parade were particularly um, successful. Here's what La Mascarade Satirique, one of the papers of the time, said about the procession. He said, people ask for an encore to the, of the slow procession, which he, that is Chief Boche, so the chief, the Ashanti chief, executes solemnly around the village with his parasol, his fly swatter, and his scepter holder. And the journalist goes on to write, Oh, Napoleon, what, what would you have said? What would you have said if you had seen the hand of justice, the insignia of your imperishable glory, travestied into ivory and ebony to serve as an attribute to an Ashanti chief? Huh? Okay. So that's clip number one. Clip number two is entitled Beignard de Nègre. This is not, in fact, a, although it takes place in the zoo, it's not part of the Ashanti footage. It was shot the year before in 1896 in the Paris acclimatization zoo. So that's important to keep in mind. Okay. Um, uh, where are we? Okay. And this is the only film that the Lumiere released a, um, um, a 25 film uh, CD-ROM in ni- eight, 1995 to celebrate the centennial of cinema. And this is the only footage on Africa they included. Okay. 
So this is entitled Beignard de Negre, so niggers swimming, so to speak. So we see the camera that's set on a platform surrounded by water. And around the platform, in the background, you see way up there, I should drop it like this, way up there, you have replicas of, replicas of sort of African housing, so to speak, Ashanti, Ashanti housing. And still behind them, we see European buildings standing in front of trees. Um, uh, to, um, uh, European building. So we have, if you will, a contrastive and hierarchizing discourse. You have nature in the sort of, in not quite the foreground, but the background of the foreground, right? So with the houses and the trees and the reed rooftops. And of course, behind the domestication of nature with solid brick building. Again, at the level of dress, you can also see the mise-en-scene. Europeans are, of course, dressed in, are fully clothed, so to speak, in suits and costumes. Where well, Africans are really semi-naked, right? From the torso up. So again, uh, underscoring that idea of proximity to nature. Now, there's a um, platform left, or this one, the first platform. Uh, where an undifferentiated number of Africans are standing with a naked torso. Further down on the left side, so I should probably replay it slightly so you would see. So this is the first, the first platform where people are jumping, so to speak. And further down on the left side, do you see a man throwing, a European man throwing something with his hat, right? So think about this. Um... So there you go. So the kids are jumping, jumping. You have these boats in the background and the gesture of throwing something in the water. Um, now, what do you think he's throwing in the water? What is it? Coins. He's throwing coins in the water and asking, if you will, these um, these kids to, in fact, dive in and and in search of that famous hidden hidden treasure of coins, so to speak. So he orders him them in and out of the water, and the scene continues with other jumping um, and coming out of the water until the film stops in a free stream on a boy jumping off the platform. Of course, the film evokes not only, uh, I would say, amphibious man, right? And also the idea, if you will, uh, that sort of how you would basically, if you can think about how you would feed a fish in a, in a fish tank or a bird in the garden, and thus you would sort of throw coins as, at, at an African boy to jump inside the water and go and, 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 and recuperate. So it's clearly an exercise of, um, uh, profound dehumanization, if you will. Next. So there are two films that are going to show to follow each other. This is a scene of entitled uh, "Women um, Doing Chores," and so they pretend to do the chores the way they would do it normally. And this is the one I wanted to insist on, which is called "Toilette de Negri," where a mother is in fact drying her baby after bathing him. So this is part of a two-film series, yeah. So the two films are devoted to a woman bathing her toddler. In Toilette de Negrion, an African mother is asked to produce her different and her own difference, her own different and that of her child in the simplest, commonest act, the intimate act of washing her baby. The setup is simple. The camera position is low and close. So we have you know, prior to Ozu, a sort of camera going down to sort of capture um, mm, 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 the act of bathing here. It's also striking that... Um, uh, this is one of the um, 
this is almost as close as one gets uh, to a close-up of a group sitting in a row at this early stage, certainly in the Lumiere footage. So the woman sitting in the front of the frame is, uh, I'm talking, this is now talking about sort of the, the, uh, toilette de Negrion one, which we can't see, unfortunately, is breastfeeding her baby and looking straight at the camera. The second one is washing her baby. Uh, the baby is standing in a basin full of water. So this is, uh, while the mother's right hand puts a sponge in a bucket and watches him. Uh, left of her, two young girls are sitting and looking straight at the camera. All four women have an impassable gaze, but it's clear that the gaze is also in conversation with someone behind the camera. So there seems to be at least two things happening. Sitting in a row, watching and breastfeeding children for the public to see at the site of the exhibition. And later, during the screening of the film, the fact of being uh, subject to command from the Lumiere operator. Two, being annoyed at being the object of spectacle for performing a normal human activity. So we can see even at the level, if you will, of these uh, uh, supposedly illiterate women who are unaware perhaps of these pseudo-scientific discourses that they return, if you will, the gaze as a sharp critique of the entire episteme and structure of feeling responsible for their very presence in this exhibition, right? So the gaze becomes, and I think, uh, the site of articulation of the critique of both the voyeuristic and exhibitionist attitude of the camera. Um, So in Toilette, I'll, I'll skip the, this. In Toilette de Negrion, which is the one we just saw, we get a sequel to the previous film. The setup is slightly different. The woman uh, who was sitting on the left side of the frame and breastfeeding her baby is no longer there. In her place, we see a crowd of women uh, uh, has gathered to observe this filming and the, uh, of the woman bathing slash drying her toddler. This time, she's more in the foreground and looks at the camera several times as she dries her child. She holds him straight toward the camera so that his nudity can be properly seen and filmed according to the camera's desire. As so throughout the film, she keeps on looking as she dries different parts of the little boy's body. When it's all over, she picks up the boy who had been crying throughout the film and the film stops running as the boy is halfway between the basin and her lap. And you see, if you look also on the left, on the right, Style of the screen, the two girls who are sitting, or the two women who are sitting, are looking at that six, six of screen space, so to speak, if you want to take Noel Birch's um, categorization. Okay. Next. I think I'll skip to this one. So, this is the scene of eating, or the zoification of childhood. Uh, after being asked to show how to play, how they play, how they dance, how they swim and bathe, Africans are now asked to perform for the cinema two other major scenes, the scene of eating and of learning. Yeah. It seems that the only thing that's missing in this entire mise-en-scene, of course, to make it a complete animal zoo, would be to show them mating in front of the public. Uh, and so the, the putative, however, we have to keep in mind that the putative difference is so pronounced and popular that it requires even an episodic form. So you have you know, the Rambo 1 and 2, so Toilette de Negrion 1 and 2, right? A serialization or a sequelization is at play here. So in the Repas de Negrion, they again, so there are two again here. Uh, Repas de Negrion, the first one, which we have not seen, sets up and participates in, in the middle of zoological difference and so demeaning that one almost resists describing it. Uh, we have, if you look at it, the children are totally ill at ease as they sit to eat for the camera. They are not given the opportunity to sit around the food in a circle. Um, that would give them more space and comfort to eat. Instead, they require to sit in an almost straight line. So this it is not this short again. Um, in front of the food, um, it's a group of six children eating in front of a bowl. We can surmise if it's Ghanaian food, perhaps some fufu um, and stew. 
They set up, thus create the condition for the children to fight like dogs over the food, like live on camera, in front of the camera, for the camera. As a result, there's a visual impression that the children are swarming around the food like bees around their hive. We have a direction, direct figuration in cinema of, icono of animal iconography, if you will, which clearly in terms of graphic montage creates that association that uh, Eisenstein was talking about. And so adding, if you add to this the fact that the children are eating with their hands out of the bowl, it's clear, um, and the way in which this is perceived on, on the European side of the world, the, the zoification, the zoification uh, is uh, made plain here. So in the sequel, which we've just seen, the reported negative, you know, the camera position changes a bit to accommodate a second group of children. So it was only the boy this time. There you have a second group sitting on the left side of the frame. Cinematically, we can see this as an attempt at narrativization itself. Since the camera cannot pan left, the operator changes the position in order to have the second group of children better emphasized in the frame. Now, after being asked and putting in a position for fighting for f of fighting for food, the children are now explicitly required to go to the bottom of the bowl and scrap it to lick the hands and of course play the crown in front in front of the camera and the boy is on the right uh one second um, in front of the camera okay so we can see upon viewing that the two groups are gendered right so girls on the left boys on the right as if it was meant as an experiment seeking to observe differences in manners of eating. But the narrative economy of the gaze in the film, as manifested by the children looking at the camera as they eat, revealed that the camera is no fly on the wall, but instead explicitly instructed the children to eat in a certain way. These instructions are given to their teachers standing behind them who are required to make them stick to the right cinematic path. I don't know if you look, let me go back again. If you look well, you see that the teachers are actually gesturing toward telling them to eat in a particular way, right? You see these two men that we don't we don't see their faces, but you see them sort of pointing toward the balls, if you will, right? But then uh, again, if you look at the ball very closely, let's take another look we see that there's actually no food in the bowl, right? There's nothing. What we see is really a reflection of the sun inside the bowl. Um, so, in normal circumstances, the children would, should be able to stand up and uh, go about their business. But in these contrived cinematic setups, it's important to show that the children are insatiable and nothing would stop them from trying to eat more, right? So as a, result, as a result, they fight among each other over an empty bowl. Again, I'm only showing you a small clip. Keep in mind that the film is about 46 seconds, right? Two to 50 seconds. Um, it becomes a game for them. They laugh and get a kick out of it. But as they pretend to eat, they're asked to look in the direction of the camera and display their bestiality. Uh, this, I think, I can consider an, an ethical way of treating children, uh, which is really, to some extent, nothing short of criminal. We can say that this film is a mind pacifier for the colonized because it displays the unbridgeable gap that separates them from the colonized, right? And this makes this film a really sort of openly ideological film, so to speak. And we can say that it really clearly... Uh, shows to us, if proof was still needed, that the Lumiere, of course, openly adhered and took part in the mise-en-scene of the colonial project. We can say, therefore, that cinema is completely and unequivocally aligned and articulated to the fait colonial. Okay. Now, so we'll wrap it up very quickly now. So now that we've looked at the corpus, I wanted to analyze some of the implications of what we 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 witness, so to speak. So the 
preceding um, uh, study, so to speak, has demonstrated that in the process and context of filming, filming Africa between 1896 and 1903, the Lumiere have not only produced a multifaceted discourse on Africa, but have also been subject to and reflected and refracted and figured cinematically the discourses of their time. And so we shall look at now the consequences of some of this. One, on the question of non-fiction, right? We may contend that the Lumiere production raises question related to the term non-fiction, right? And of course, this is the debate that we have in documentary itself, right? Uh, what is stage and what is real? Yeah, back to the very beginning. So it goes back to the very beginning, long before Flaherty and, 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 and everybody else. Um, it's clearly not a naive record of what was in front of the camera. Yeah. Uh, in both travelogue, the travelogue and minimal genre, we, we can see, we can see a high level of sophistication of the mise en scène of the profilmic time and space. And this mise en scène, of course, was rooted in the acceptance and enactment of the premises and, to some extent, inevitability of uh, imperialism, colonialism, etc. Second consideration on the question of African cinema, the beginning of African cinema. The question of the beginning of African is also raised, in, in, as is raised, the question of what counts as a director in early cinema. The Lumiere operators, we know, were de facto film directors. And chief among them was, of course, Alexander Promieux, who shot, uh, in fact, who supposedly shot, according to Jean-Claude Seguin, who wrote a book on him, who shot more than half the entire production um, of the Lumiere. So if you think of 1428 or 30, half of this would be 1700 something, right? So he is the Lumiere auteur per excellence, if you will, uh, in that sense. But we, um, we've, we've seen, of course, how he has experimented with editing and, and in the profilmic space and deep staging. So if you accept the premise of the operator as film director, we can interrogate, and we are, I unfortunately don't have the footage to show you again, though that makes it more uh, 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 imperative to find this footage so that you don't only take my word for it. We can interrogate the status of Mr. Oko, the school teacher, who is present in a lot of these uh, films uh, about the Ashanti. Here, he's the one again. To the kids. So we see him in the the Ashanti footage choreographing fight scenes, dance scenes, eating scenes, <laughs> literally, and and uh, schooling uh, scenes, right? So if we can, this is a proposition, of course, so it may be accepted or not, but if we can take uh, the idea of directing as um, involving, uh, at minimum, the idea of guiding the artistic and dramatic aspects of the film, we can consider that this is exactly what he is doing. And that by his, through, in, in a reflexive way, because he's actually in the frame itself, right? So through his presence in the frame and directing the actors in the frame it, itself, he becomes the director and shifts its place, if you will, with the operator who becomes the person who only records what's happening in front of the pro filmic space. I don't know if you see what I'm trying to get at, right? So... This, of course, is very interesting because it's, it, it, it tells that, that very, very, very early in, in the hist in history, this gentleman had understood the operation of cinema, right? And that to a large extent, he may be considered as one of the first to at least, um, uh, uh, have attempt or have an in fact, directed films filmed by the Lumiere operator, right? 
And the consequences of this is 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 important because it means, in other words, that one of the very first African filmmakers, in fact, started making or at least directing film scenes in 1897. So in terms of the periodization, at least, of African cinema, we can probably take it certainly much earlier than 1960 or Usman Sam for example, whom we're going to talk about tomorrow, right? That is something to think about. Other consideration, the question of colonial cinema. We know that the Lumiere, all the footage that we've shown or talked about so far, that they flirted with, they've adhered to, and figured, aided, and abetted the colonial project. That is beyond any doubt. Now, the consequences for this, of course, is proven by the unfolding of history itself. So that the chief Lumiere operator, Alexander Promier, whom I was talking about, went on after his departure from the Lumiere house and a failed attempt at creating his own company. And I think he probably worked for Pate, I think, for some time. He went on to found the cinema unit of the colonial government of Algeria, of the, the colonial, the cinema unit of the government general of colonial Algeria, right? So from making all these colonial films, sort of the latest, sort of the, we can say, the inevitable logic of the Lumiere cinema ends with creating one of the strongest institutions of colonial cinema in history in Algeria itself. And he was the chief, the head of this cinema and photo unit. So we can say that from propagandist for, for, for the Lumiere, he ends up headed, heading the colonial propaganda film infrastructure of Algeria after World War I. That is really important. Okay. On early cinema, and I'll wrap up <laughs> soon. Yeah. Okay, we good? Okay. On early cinema. Uh, the Lumiere Africa Corpus also showed that the study of the Lumiere body of film has, unfortunately, so far focused largely on film that specifically dealt with the Euro-American experience, right? That's why we only see arrival of the train, uh -huh, baby's breakfast, August and his, his you know, uh, workers living factory, etc. Yeah? We can say that this, of course, represents a blind spot in the research, right? In the historiography of early cinema. Because we can say, in some extent, to some extent, that um, uh, the historiography of early cinema has primarily dealt with the Lumiere in a quasi hagiographic terms, right? It's really very little critique. This is a problem, I think, right? Because um, this hagiography, this hagiography, sort of emphasizes Euro modernist narratives of progress and attraction. Now, it shows, by doing so, I think, this shows that the writing of history, of the history of early cinema, implicitly or explicitly, aligned itself somehow with also the way power is distributed around the world. If the dominant version of the history of early cinema coincides with the history of Europe and America, who are also the larger colonizing forces, then we can start to ask serious questions. So we can say that by overtly silencing an entire realm of the Lumiere production, they make it seem to the non-specialist that no such thing exists. So people who are in this room probably are watching this footage for the first time in their life. Some people at least, right? So this mode of historiography, therefore, de facto disappears in the Argentinian sense, desaparecido, right? Disappears, a fundamental element in the understanding and processing of the history of cinema in particular, and of history itself in general. So the failure, by failing to 
to see, articulate, and systematically theorize the Lumiere production in and North Africa and, and on Africa. They failed to make the necessary link between the Lumiere and political power, the Lumiere and economic power, the Lumiere and the, 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 the culture that surrounds them. Now, Tom Gunning and Andre Gaudreau have coined the term cinema of attraction to characterize the film that included the Lumiere productions, right? The exotic scenes. But I'd say they don't really significantly discuss everything that was going on at the attractions, right? Uh, the human zoo uh, was power not only part of, but in fact a major part of these attractions that brought in money, business. It served to confirm and advance scientific theories. In other words, I think the term center of attractions only incompletely captured the complexity of these politically and ideological charge and marred attractions. Um, I've tried to show that the minimal genre, for example, must be included or at least articulated with the cinema of attraction to give a more complex um, account of these early days of cinema. And of course, I, I can't fault in fact Gunning for this because he actually says himself that when they introduce the cinema of attraction, he says, I'll, I'll just quote him ad litera. In introducing the term the cinema of attraction, we theorize that the spectator, the area of preoccupation of much of film theory of the 70s and 80s, needed to be rethought historically, with the acknowledgement that different regimes of spectatorship could be isolated. If that is the case, what do we make of the spectatorship regime of the human zoo? <laughs> which was part and parcel of the culture of attraction, which has largely been overlooked, right? I think people have talked about human exhibition for hundreds of years, but the link to early cinema, for some reason, at least in, a, in that way, has not really been made. So we can take numerous examples. In Switzerland, for example, which is a country that didn't have a colonial empire. <laughs> the city of Zurich, for example, was home to no less than 62 ethnic spectacles, African villages, human zoo between 1878 and 1960. The exhibitions took place in open air settings, vaudeville theaters, zoos, on the lake, with humans and animals exhibited side by side. There are even shows for school children at the circus and, of course, at the panopticum. So we can think of Foucault here. So these sadistic human shows had their share of casualties as well. We have to keep in mind that you know uh, there are sort of physical implications. So the members, for example, of an, of an African village show in Lausanne, Switzerland, who were fed only husked rice, caught berry berry, and two of them, their name, Bokari and Sanabolu, died. Um, in, 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 in Tevren, for example, in Belgium, we know that seven Congolese died in, of, of, of pneumonia. And the names were Ekia, Zao, Gemba, Kikut, Kitukwa, Mpeya, Sambo, and Mibange. If you look at Raul Peck's films, for example, uh, Lumumba, The Death of a Prophet, he sort of explores this question. In Paris itself, uh, sorry. Uh, so, so for if we want to come back to those who, two who died in Switzerland, they had no respite even in their death. During their burial, for example, the cemetery was reportedly full of onlookers and journalists, apparently, who apparently reported on the Muslim burial ceremonies as yet another spectacle. In Paris, human exhibitions had to do with the conversions, a conversion of science and spectacle, which made them even more pernicious because they became part of the epistemology of our time from the latter part of the 19th century. The Parisian Zoological Acclimatization Garden, which was opened by Napoleon in 1860, ended up being more successful for the humans who were paired with the exhibited animals, right? I think the term, I think the, 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 the director of the zoo, who was sort of a famous scientist, uh, Geoffrey Saint Hilaire, right? I think there's a metro station to his name in Paris, in fact, created the term anthropozoological. Anthropozoological, right? And so, 
numerically speaking, uh, at least at the, at the, at the Parisian Zoo, some of these exhibitions boosted an attendance of over 1 million tickets. So in 1877, over 1 million tickets were sold to people who were coming to see the fellow or non-fellow beings exhibited with animals. And, uh, those who have done research on that, uh, have uh, people like Pascal Blanchard and others who have written a book called Zoe may have argued that if you, want to total the, 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 the spectrum of spectatorship involved in the human zoo, it would, over the years, it would be close to something like 400 million people. Think about it. 400 million people. So it's larger than the population of the United States. Right? Okay. So, the pervasiveness and ubiquity of this show is enlightening in, term, in terms of the kind of spectatorship this involved, uh, but also profoundly sobering as to the extent to which it was part of the culture of spectatorship. In Europe alone, the following places and dates were highlighted in alphabetical order as having hosted these villages in a similar, similar show. You have places like Antwerp, Barcelona, Budapest in 1890, Dusseldorf, St. Petersburg, Freiburg 1903. Um, uh, Geneva, Gent, Glasgow, Göteborg, Vienna, Hanover, Köln, Lausanne, Leipzig, Liège, Milan, uh, Munich, Oslo, Moscow, Warsaw, Naples, Copenhagen, all the cool cities that we know. Uh, Palermo, <laughs> Payen, Prague, Rotterdam, Film Festival, Stockholm, etc., etc. In light of the above, I think the time may have come also to interrogate, I would say, the ethics and politics of attractions, right? In other words, what does it mean for us in 2011 today to use the term cinema of attraction, to refer to a practice that consisted in dehumanizing two-thirds of the planet, right? What is attract? What is attractive about this, right? What is thrilling and warm about putting on the same continuing human beings and animals, semi-human, semi-animal being? What is at stake in creating theoretically new anthropozoological categories? What does it mean for us to enshrine it in our vocabulary in film studies? Could it be that we are now in a position to say, like Jacques Rivette, I don't know if you know the famous Jacques Rivette quote about le traveling est une affaire de morale, right? He's sort of commenting on Gilles Pontecorvo's film um, Capo, right? The title of his article was Le traveling de Capo. And here, for example, he described the, I'll just move this, just a digression, but you know, and I'll translate it from the French. He says, look, however, in Capo, the shot in which Riva commits suicide in throwing herself on the electric barbed wire. The man who decides, that is the filmmaker who decides at that moment to, to perform a forward traveling shot, right? To reframe the cadaver, so to speak, right? So, so she, she, she gets electrified and Ponte Corvo goes to the other side of the barbed wire and shows her, if you will, right? Uh, by inscribing the raised hand, um, in an angle of his final frame, this man is entitled to only one thing, only, um, I'm now looking for the term, maybe only profound contempt on our part, right? And so what does this mean, therefore, for us? To, so, so can we also say that the cinema des attractions est une affaire de morale? Right? Is it not contemptuous to use this term to refer to this period, knowing to this period, knowing what it implies in terms of the dehumanization of more than two-thirds of mankind? That's a question. We may also interrogate the politics of the cinema of attraction. To what extent, one may ask, could we look at it as 
perhaps a case of depoliticization of the gays, right? If we were to put the cinema of attractions on a couch and interrogate its unconscious, right? Could we say that there might be a desire, there might have been a desire at the, so at the initial impulse of putting it together, a desire to return to perhaps simpler times, right? Remember the 70s, 80s, hyper-ideological. So a return to simpler times where political analysis did not really spoil the aesthetics of shock and awe and thrill. Does the theoretical genealogy of cinema of attraction not contain within itself an attempt to rescue a pre, an a, or a non-political aspect of um, theorization? Because we know that attractions as figured in the Lumiere Africa corpus were political in so far as they articulated a certain distribution of power in the world, a certain relationship of dominance within the world. So we can look at the picturesque and the exotic as perspectival. These Africans did not think of themselves as exotic. Eh? Or animals are picture, right? They were, they said they were, right? And so it's the look that politics that turned them into objects. There's a political gaze that assigns places to the looker and to the person who is being looked at. Yeah? Back to Malvi again, if you will. And so this, of course, uh, I think raised questions as to um, even, again, the question of spectatorship. What is the nature of the colonial spectator in our discussion of spectatorship in the colonial era, in the period of the cinema of attraction? We have not really accounted yet for the colonial spectator, right? How can he be accounted for in light not only of the Lumiere Africa corpus, but the thousands of films that were shot around the topic and in that period? Mm. Finally, um, if we, uh, we can also sort of raise formal slash historiographic questions. So around those questions of the beginning of continuity editing of deep staging, for example. I think, for example, if you take Andre Godro's account of sort of early editing practices in the time of early cinema, he says, for example, stop motion in camera editing dates back to 1896. Yeah, this involves two special temporal fragments in one shot film. Yeah, the same film, two special temporal fragments, because the, the the operator who was cranking decided to stop at some point before the end of the footage and start again. So we have two different um, shots within the same film. He also mentioned the use of two or more fragments of the same action, but taking place in different spaces or still two or more shots of the same space on the same film, but from different camera perspectives. But the date that he puts to these you know, early attempts at editing are later than the Lumiere Africa Corpus, either 1901, 18, 1901, for example, for, uh, for um, um, sort of a shooting of two or more segments of the same action taking, in diff taking place in different places. But he does not mention the Promio experiment in Egypt, for example, in the Castle Nil Bridge uh, series, where we have, I would say, three or four shots of the same space, really. It's the bridge, but uh, of different, they're not within the same frame, but they're of different film strips from different camera position at the entry and exit position. So, again, this sort of comes back to one of the things that I was saying, whether or not we could consider Promia as having experimented with a temporal, special temporal continuity as early as 18, 
97. Of course, the same applies to uh, the question of um, of uh, deep uh, of narrative. I think that's also something that I personally, I think, I remember that in the question of cinema of attraction, there's really this debate between the spectacle and the narrative, right? which is for uh, uh, <laughs> so cinema, <laughs> cinema, the, the cinema of attraction largely has its success um, founded on the idea that somehow it sort of delays narrative a little bit and sort of emphasizes the spectacle, right? Now, of course, Gunning's position on this in 18, 1985 and in 2011 has significantly evolved, right? Because, you know, there's been criticism from people like Masser and other people and so on. I think today he agrees that we cannot establish a relationship of consecution between a spectacle and narrative in the period that he's talking about, right? But if you look at the Lumiere uh, corpus itself, you see that the spectacle, because these this were, <laughs> if anything, spectacle, um, The spectacle was, I can say, an effect of narrative, right? So, so the narrative precedes the spectacle. So what you see has already been pre-narrativized, in other words, by the glow of the general culture, colonial culture that existed um, at the time. So that... So again, it's not a case of consecution, but even here, of precedence of narrative over spectacle, if you will, which I think we should sort of think about in terms of these, these uh, the relationship between these two categories in the framework of of um, the cinema of attraction. For example, in responding to the criticism of Masser, for example, Masser argued that. Um, we can talk about narrative even if it's not within the diegesis of the text itself. But if we look at it in relation to the context, right? And that context includes the lecture, for example, which accompanies, um, some of the, accompanied some of these films and narrativized them. So if that is true, how about the, like I said, the structure of feeling narrativizing this image prior to their very existence, right? Sort of the structure of feeling bringing into existing these images themselves. So that, uh, again, the narrative even precedes, um, uh, 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 the, the images. And so that, I think, takes us to another, I think, side of the discussion that still, I think, to some extent, should, um, I hope, uh, help us at least start discussing about the validity of this, this sort of narrative spectacle discussion, uh, at least, or if not validity, the, the different forms of articulation, yeah, of this. I should probably stop here. Yeah. Thank you.